This is heavy stuff, I know, but stay with me on this. Hey all, it's Linda. Welcome back to my channel. For today's video, I am really, really excited because this is, I hope, the start of a new series on my channel. So in June, I did a video based on Pride Month and I talked about how Pride started. And I did that, of course, while putting on makeup because I am a makeup channel. And in that story, I talked about how everyone knows that there are Pride events and Pride festivals across the world, but maybe they don't know how or why it started. And I talked about the events that led up to that and I talked about the Stonewall riots. And it got me thinking, how many stories are there there out there where we might know the end of the story, the punchline of the story, we might know bits and pieces of the story, but a lot of us don't know how it actually started. So this new series on my channel, I am going to be talking about exactly that and this is going to be called How It Started. <laughs> I'm going to talk about different stories. Some of them may be darker than others. Others are going to be quite lighthearted, but I'm going to talk to you about how these events started, where they culminated, and then what they led up to and how they got there. I'm going to tell you that story while putting makeup on my face. Everything is going to be listed in the description box down below, but we are getting started off with a bang. And today I am going to be talking about the satanic panic of the 80s and 90s. Personally, I had heard bits and pieces about the satanic panic. I had heard the phrase and I knew that it touched a lot of things, but I had no idea where it actually started. And there was a pretty definitive point where it all started. So I was kind of fascinated to learn about all that. And I hope you all will too, but you can let me know, comment down below, give this video a thumbs up. Let me know if you like this. Let me know if you like this idea as a series. Your feedback is the best way that I'm going to know how you feel about all of this. And also if you have ideas, if you know of something where everyone knows the ending, but might not know what led up to that, let me know down below, but we are going to get started. So the satanic panic to me is sort of like a gun, okay? You have this catapult where everything started and it shoots off and it hits something and that in turn makes the bullets go like this and shrapnel goes everywhere and it touches all these different parts of the world, of society, and it's just, it's just crazy. There are so many directions this story goes, so we're gonna jump right in. I do want to offer a little warning that this story may be disturbing to some. It does talk about, obviously, Satanism. It does talk about child abuse and child sexual abuse. It does talk about mutilation to both animals and humans. So please keep that in mind. And here we go. So as I mentioned, I am going to be focusing on the main satanic panic events of the 80s and 90s, but fear of Satanism started way before that. Things like the Manson family murders in 1969, and then the publishing of Anton LaVey's Satanic Bible after that really got people going, and even the release of The Exorcist, both the book and the movie. But it wasn't until 1980 that this really became at the forefront of everyone's minds. So in 1980, there was a book released by Lawrence Padzer called Michelle Remembers. Now, Padzer was a psychiatrist and he wrote it with his then patient, Michelle Smith, and Michelle later became his wife. Now, Padzer first started treating Michelle for depression due to a miscarriage in 1973. But later in 1976, she told him she felt like there was something she had to tell him, that she had to confide in him, but she couldn't remember what it was. They eventually started doing hypnosis treatments. In the book, Padser then said that he and Michelle had a session where she screamed for 25 minutes straight and eventually she started speaking in the voice of a five-year-old. According to him, he spent over 600 hours over the next 14 months with her using hypnosis to help her recover memories. And apparently in her memory, she started telling stories of satanic ritual abuse that had happened when she was five years old and in the care of her mother. She said that in the 50s, her mother and others were all part of a satanic cult and that the final ritual they performed was an 81 day ritual 81 day ritual. Okay. Keep that in mind. That is nearly three months long that supposedly summoned Satan himself and involved the intervention of Jesus, the Virgin Mary and Michael, the archangel, all who removed the memories from her head until the time was right. Under these hypnosis sessions, Michelle said that during the ritual, she was tortured, locked in cages, sexually assaulted, and forced to participate in various rituals and witnessed several human sacrifices and said that she was rubbed with the blood and body parts of various sacrificed infants and adults. 
This is heavy stuff, I know, but stay with me on this. This book was wildly publicized both before and during its release, and then it was considered a publishing success once it came out, and then Padser and Smith even toured the country together on a book tour to promote the book. Now, almost immediately upon its release, the book was starting to be questioned. Once Padser was fully questioned, he withdrew his assertion that it was the Church of Satan who had abused Michelle when Anton LaVey, who was the founder of the Church of Satan, threatened to sue. Also, it's worth noting that the alleged events took place years before the Satanic Bible was even released. Even Michelle Smith's father denied all of these allegations against her mother and also claimed that he could refute every one of these allegations. In later years, so many inconsistencies from the book started to come out. There was a car crash that was described in the book in great detail and there was no mention of this. Now, this might not seem weird. A car crash doesn't get reported that often, right? But in this town where the car crash was alleged to have taken place, that town's newspaper reported every single road incident at the time. So they were able to look back in the paper from that time and, hmm, there's no car crash mentioned there. Michelle Smith's school also noted that she had never been absent from school especially during the time period of the alleged 81-day ritual that she spoke of while under hypnosis. Basically, no one could or would corroborate the events that were taking place in the book. Now, despite the lack of there being even a shred of evidence, many people started to believe Smith's stories and believed the story that Padster was telling. They believed the claims of abuse to be true and claimed that they were evidence of a worldwide intergenerational satanic conspiracy to abuse and sacrifice human beings. Many including police officers, started using the book as a sort of textbook. And like I said, even though none of the claims could really be confirmed, once the book came out, the damage was already done. The early 80s started seeing so many claims of satanic ritual abuse, and much of it is alleged to have come from the hubbub surrounding the release of this book, Michelle Remembers. Now, on another note, in the early 1980s, there was sort of a generalized, heightened awareness of child abuse in general. Investigations of incest allegations in California were charged with cases now being led by social workers who were using leading and coercive interviewing techniques. Because of this and increased prosecutions in general, many that were accused of abuse started confessing to the abuse to basically get a plea deal. So many of these children were placed in protective custody by Child Protection Services, and some of them started making allegations of horrific physical and sexual abuse by their caregivers with organized rituals and claimed that much of the sexual abuse took place during satanic rituals and using satanic symbols. These cases helped create the label satanic ritual abuse in the media and among various professionals. Even some adults that had previously been in psychotherapy started having recovered memories of satanic ritual abuse from when they were children. Now, when you're seeing this on the news constantly, it's not completely out of the realm of possibility to at least give thought to the fact that maybe it came from these ideas from the media being put in people's heads and they started going, oh yeah, I remember when that happened to me too. But then came the case that really skyrocketed everything. So taking my gun analogy, we have Michelle Remembers. They fire the bullet and they hit this. In 1983 in Manhattan Beach, California, a woman named Judy Johnson reported to the police that her son had been sodomized by her estranged husband, but also by a teacher at her son's preschool, which was McMartin Preschool, and the man's name was Ray Bucky. Judy's belief that her son had been abused stemmed from the fact that he started having very painful bowel movements. We don't know whether or not her son corroborated this and said, yes, this is why I'm having the painful bowel movements, but that is where Judy started her investigation and accusations. In addition, she also began making more accusations, including that people at the daycare had had sexual encounters with animals and that Ray Bucky flew in the air. Bucky was questioned, but he was not prosecuted at that time due to lack of evidence. But even though he wasn't prosecuted, police did send a form letter to over 200 homes to the families of all of the students at McMartin Preschool and stated that their children may or may not have been sexually abused and they asked the parents to start questioning their children. Now, I can see why they would do this, okay? If there's an investigation against a teacher in your school, you need to act on it. You can't just sweep it under the rug. I understand that. But I feel like sending a letter like that is going to ignite immediate hysteria among all the families, 
asking all of them to question their children. I mean, and how, how do you even do that? Like, as like, I'm not a parent, but I could only imagine that these parents were suddenly terrified. The letter basically explained that there was a criminal investigation against Ray Bucky and asked the parents to question their child to see if they were a witness or a victim of any crimes in general, but they went on to list possible criminal sexual acts that may have occurred. So they said, any information from your child having ever observed Ray Bucky to leave a classroom alone with a child during any nap period, or if they have ever observed Ray Bucky tie up a child, it is important. Now, I do believe that it is worth noting that before the preliminary hearing concluded, Judy Johnson, the mother who accused Ray Bucky of sexually abusing her son, she was diagnosed with acute paranoid schizophrenia. Now, this does not mean necessarily that she imagined the whole thing or that she made it up. I'm not accusing her of that, but I do feel that that's worth noting because a lot of articles do point that out. Several hundred children were then interviewed and the techniques of which were considered to be pretty coercive and speculative. And they invited children to pretend and speculate about what may or may not have happened. Police allowed an unlicensed psychotherapist named Key McFarland to conduct the examinations of the children. And Key McFarland famously used anatomically correct dolls of children. By the spring of 1984, it was claimed that over 360 children had admitted to being abused, but only 41 of these children ultimately testified at the grand jury and pretrial hearings, and fewer than 12 testified at the actual trials. Experts who reviewed the videotapes of the children being questioned were highly critical of the techniques used, referring to them as coercive, directive, problematic, and adult directed in a way that forced the children to follow a sort of script. It's very hard to do my eyebrows and talk at the same time, so I'm gonna be heads down while this is happening. One criminal psychologist named Michael P. Maloney concluded that many of the kids' statements in the interview were even generated by the examiner. Now, while there were a lot of disturbing allegations made by these kids, some of them were really bizarre and seemed to overlap with different accusations that were uh, mirroring kind of like the emerging satanic panic in the media in general. Some kids say that they saw witches fly, that they traveled in a hot air balloon, and that they were taken through secret underground tunnels below McMartin Preschool. When shown a series of photos of possible abusers, one of the children even identified actor Chuck Norris as one of the abusers. Now, as I just mentioned, some of the abuse was alleged to have taken place at underground secret tunnels under the school, but there was no evidence of these tunnels. They even did, you know, excavations. There were no tunnels under the school. But there were even claims that the children were flushed down toilets where they led into a tunnel and they were sexually abused and then they were cleaned up and given back to their parents at the end of the day, all clean and fresh and ready to go. All in all, seven teachers and administrators were charged with over 115 counts of child abuse, which was later expanded to over 321 counts of child abuse involving 48 children. The preliminary hearings lasted 20 months and during that time, Lawrence Padzer and Michelle Smith, remember them? They wrote the book, literally wrote the book. They were brought in as sort of experts and they even talked to the parents. Oh, but they didn't just talk to the parents, they talked to the children. And they were later have believed to have greatly influenced the children's testimony. In 1986, District Attorney Ira Reiner called the evidence extremely weak and dropped all of the charges against five of the defendants, but the remaining two, Ray Bucky and his mother, Peggy McMartin Bucky, remained in custody. In 1990, after years of these trials had already been going strong, all charges were dropped against Peggy McMartin Bucky, but Ray was cleared on only 52 of the 65 counts, but freed on bail. The second trial opened later that year in 1990, and Bucky was then cleared on six of the remaining 13 counts, and it resulted in a hung jury. So prosecutors just gave up, and Bucky was dismissed on all charges after already having been jailed for over five years. The media focused really hard on this case, and it attracted national attention. The New York Times in particular had a heavy focus on the fact that these children might have been subjected to satanic rituals. Let's go back to the gun analogy. We have the book, which fired into the McMartin preschool trials, and then it went 
everywhere. So like I said, that trial was only the beginning. In 1980, the game Dungeons and Dragons came out and it was wildly successful. So it is a fantasy tabletop role-playing game and it's now commonly recognized as kind of the beginning of the role-playing game industry. Players create their own character and those characters embark on imaginary journeys. A dungeon master or a DM sort of serves as the game's referee and storyteller and the characters all interact with each other and they give each other knowledge and they have battles and they gain treasure. So it, it's just, you know, a fantasy role playing game. But in the mid 1980s, some Christian groups began to allege that the game promoted practices such as devil worship, witchcraft, suicide and murder. They criticized the game manuals because they depicted naked breasts in drawings of female humanoid monsters like harpies and succubi because obviously the female breast is a tool used to recruit people to Satanism. That totally makes sense. Like I said, though, they argued that the game was a tool to recruit people to Satanism. They said that it was introducing our nation's youth to suicide, murder, and satanic ritual abuse. Now, eventually, some of the controversial references that were in the Dungeons & Dragons manual and the artwork were removed, including the names Devil and Demons. Now, because of the panic surrounding this game and the coverage of that in the media, so many people just for playing this game began to be ostracized and made fun of and people were told that they worshipped Satan and they worshipped the devil regardless of their actual religious beliefs. Now, on top of that, in May of 1985, the TV program 2020 ran a special on Satan worship where they discussed animal mutilations clearly used in some sort of bizarre ritual, rock music associated with devil worship, satanic graffiti, and backwards messages in songs. More about that later. Also, forgive the overuse of finger quotations, but I want to make sure I'm telling you that these were exact phrases used in the media about satanic ritual abuse. Now, the host of this 2020 special, Hugh Downs, started by saying that police were skeptical in reporting these acts and that even the show was skeptical in reporting them. But there is no question that there is something going on out there and that's sufficient reason enough for 2020 to investigate it. Following that statement, though, the program talked about cult activity, saying their followers were very secretive but found in all walks of life. So this is very similar to the McCarthy era, where they warned everybody to watch out for your neighbors. The person living next door could be a communist. Well, now the media is telling people, watch out, person living right next door to you could be a Satanist. In 1987, Geraldo Rivera, who was then a daytime talk show host, um, he actually is still around now, and he's a regular contributor on Fox News reports such as The Five. He produced an episode on alleged secret cults. Devil worship. Exposing Satan's underground. In this episode, he claimed estimates are there are over one million Satanists in the United States, and they're linked in a highly organized secretive network. Nearly 20 million people tuned in to watch this special. That is how viral the satanic panic had gone at this point. Many people, including psychotherapists, social workers, police, and religious fundamentalists, would use this specific special and tapings of this special to support the theory that cults, in fact, did exist and that they were committing serious crimes. By the late 80s, there was an overwhelming number of therapists claiming that their clients or people they saw had suffered satanic ritual abuse. And some of the treatments that they would suggest included Christian psychotherapy, support groups of anti-satanic warriors, and even exorcism. During this time, though, federal funding started to go way up to support research on child abuse and child sexual abuse. So this is a good thing in general, right? Of course, we want to prosecute anyone that does commit abuse to a child. But at this time, funding was also heavily provided for conferences supporting the idea that satanic ritual abuse was a legit thing. Now at these conferences, it was pretty typical for prosecutors to attend and exchange advice on how to best secure convictions where they brought up satanic ritual abuse as a motive. Some of the tactics they really liked at the time included things like destroying notes, refusing to share evidence, and also refusing to tape any interviews that involved children. Things at this point were escalating quickly and no one, nowhere, nothing was safe from the claims of satanic ritual abuse. And when I say that nowhere and nothing was safe, that includes you, Papa Smurf. Is this a satanic toy? It is used to represent the occult, yes. We see Papa Smurf drawing a pentagram, a five-pointed occultic star on the ground. He lights candles at each point. He dances inside the pentagram. Yep, that's a real clip. 
Now, around this time, a psychologist named Catherine Gould published a list of indicators of how you could diagnose satanic ritual abuse in young children. So these indicators were vague and super, super common, but people didn't care at that point. Shortly after this list was published, allegations started appearing throughout the world in the UK, Scandinavia, Canada, just everywhere. The belief in satanic ritual abuse as a whole was spreading rapidly through the mental health professional community despite, again, the overwhelming lack of evidence. Now, proof was provided in the form of pictures drawn by patients, pictures of mutilated animals, and heavy metal album covers. Now, let's dig into heavy metal for a second, okay? Heavy metal music was not the first genre to be accused of Satanism and devil worshiping. In the 20s, the blues were regarded as devil's music, and in the 50s, people blamed Elvis's swinging hips as him being possessed by dark forces. In the 1960s, the Rolling Stones released Sympathy for the Devil. It was around. People have always been claiming this since literally the beginning of time. Now, in the early 1980s, heavy metal music was at its heyday. Bands like Def Leppard, Anthrax, and Megadeth and Slayer, they were dominating the charts and getting a ton of Grammy nominations. MTV launched in 1981, and suddenly people could see the faces behind these bands, and these bands showed up with flames shooting behind them, and they were wearing black and white makeup. Because of this, heavy metal was now being touted as just another recruitment tool for Satanists to lure innocent youth into their cults. Bands were even starting to be accused of hiding subliminal messages in their music that when you played the song backwards, it was a satanic recruitment tool. Here's an example of what some people thought that Stairway to Heaven was saying when you played it backwards. The captioning on this video, I will say, was not created by me. <laughs> Yeah, you think that's a stretch at all? You think? You think? Churches across the nation started hosting record-burning parties, and one former rocker-turned-pastor, and yes, that was the wording they used, rocker-turned-pastor. He said he believed that Satan was possessing the singers and manipulating their voices so that subliminally implanted backwards messages could be placed on the record to destroy the youth of America. I feel like I keep using this very dramatic voice, but I, I just, I don't know how to take it completely seriously. Now, some bands admitted to using this to their advantage, okay? When Motley Crue released their album Shout at the Devil, the original artwork featured a pentagram. Later in 2010, frontman Vince Neil said, some people thought we were satanic and angry. We always thought that was funny, but we were like, hey, if it gets us stardom and attention, let's go with that. We were so starved for stardom that we were willing to do whatever it took, but there was no anger at all. We were just having fun. In 1985, a committee was born that called themselves the Parents Music Resource Center, and they were headed up by Tipper Gore. They made up a playlist called The Filthy 15 that contained songs they believe were related to sex, drugs, and the occult. Nine out of the 15 bands on this list were heavy metal bands. Also, this is a pretty banging playlist. I already checked. Somebody definitely did create this playlist on Spotify, so go ahead and listen to that. Now, one of the most notable and horrible areas that the Satanic Panic hit were court cases. In 1984, a Cuban immigrant named Frank Fuster, along with his undocumented wife, was accused of molesting eight children. Now, Frank was no saint. He had been accused and convicted of crimes in the past, but these victims testified that the Fusters led them in satanic rituals and terrorized them by forcing them to watch Frank Fuster mutilate birds. Despite the fact that the interview sessions were extremely coercive and that there was no physical evidence, he was sentenced to six consecutive life sentences or a minimum of 165 years in prison. As of now, he has already been in prison for over 35 years, and he's not even eligible for parole until 2135. In 1985, 20-year-old James Vance and his 18-year-old friend Raymond Belknap, they had a night of partying, and then they went to a local playground where they each shot themselves. Belknap died that same night, but Vance, who survived the gunshot, went on to file a lawsuit against heavy metal band Judas Priest, claiming there was subliminal devil-worshipping messages hidden in their music. At the end of the day, there was obviously no evidence for this at all, and the band avoided any legal responsibility. But by far, the most notable case of this era where this was involved was that of the West Memphis Three. Now, I'm not going to go too deeply into this case, but if you would like to see a separate video on this, because I believe that so many people have heard of it, they know the end, they know that certain parts of it happened, but they don't know how it all started. So if that's something you'd like to see a separate video about, please let me know down below. But to recap it very briefly, in 1993, three teenagers, Damian Eccles, 
Jason Baldwin, and Jesse Miss Kelly were all accused and later convicted of the horrific sexual assault and murder of three young boys in the town of West Memphis, Arkansas. While there was absolutely no physical evidence connecting the teens to the crimes, their goth lifestyles and love of heavy metal music and rumors that they worshipped Satan were enough to fuel the fires to point police directly to those teens. They were eventually tried and convicted, and let me state again, without any physical evidence, and they sat in prison for over 18 years. In 2011, they were all eventually freed after new DNA evidence proved without a shadow of a doubt that they had no connection to these killings. I'm gonna hop off camera real quick. I'm gonna finish up my eyes, do blush and lips. I'll be right back to wrap this up. So even though this satanic panic was still in full swing, around 1987, things started to sort of turn the corner and some media started reporting on this as skeptical. They began to offer some negative views about the whole thing. The general panic was said to have ended sometime between 92 and 95. In 1995, HBO released a made-for-TV movie based on the McMartin trial, and instead of painting Ray Bucky as a sexual predator, he was shown as a victim of overreaching and over-obsessive prosecution. This really shifted people's opinions and thoughts based around the McMartin trial. In 1995, Geraldo Rivera even offered an apology for the episode of his talk show that he released on the Satanic Panic. The National Center on Child Abuse and Neglect even conducted a study and found that among the over 12,000 accusations of satanic ritual abuse, there was absolutely no evidence for a well-organized intergenerational satanic cult who sexually molested and tortured children. Although they did say that there was convincing evidence of lone perpetrators saying that Satan is what led them to do these things, but there was never any evidence that proved that. Later, Margaret Talbot, a writer for the New York Times said, and I'm gonna read this quote directly, when you once believed something that now strikes you as absurd, even unhinged, it can be almost impossible to summon that feeling of credulity again. Maybe that's why it's so easy for most of us to forget rather than to explain the satanic scare that gripped this country in the early 80s. The myth that devil worshippers had set up shop in our daycare centers, where their clever adepts were sodomizing and raping children, practicing ritual sacrifice, shedding their clothes, drinking blood, and eating feces, all un noticed by parents, authorities, and neighbors. So was I right or was I right about this story going in so many different directions? Again, it started just from a book, from a random book written in 1980 that had no backing to it. I, it's, it's just, it's mind-blowing that because of this book, okay, people went to jail. People's lives were completely ruined. Now, the media did not help situations any. They really didn't. But it's almost like, in a way, part of me is like, who can blame them? Because if ABC is jumping on these satanic ritual cult stories and you're NBC over here, well, you need to keep up with the Joneses. It's all about ratings, right? But it just, at the end of the day, it just, it pisses me off, frankly. It really pisses me off. And if it pisses me off, then I can't even imagine how people like Ray Bucky, Damian Eccles, Jason Baldwin, Jesse Miss Kelly. How did all these people feel when their lives have literally been ruined just by a media hype over satanic panic? So that is it. I hope you all enjoyed this video. Again, if you liked it, please leave me feedback in the comments below. Give this video a thumbs up. Let me know that you're liking this. I do have other stories. And again, there are some that are definitely not as dark. There are some that definitely are kind of dark, but there are some that definitely are a little more lighthearted, like the one I'm thinking about doing next. So please let me know what you think of this. I hope you enjoyed it. I really, really enjoyed learning about this, to be honest, because again, I had heard of the satanic panic, but I had no idea where it started and how many different things it touched. So that's it. Thank you so, so much for being here. You all can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Those are all Glitter Fallout. And as always and forever, you are super freaking rock stars. Oh, I'm doing the devil symbol here. Ooh. And I will see you in the next video. Bye.